All right, so today we're at Rain Crow Farm with Rachel and Dylan. And uh, tell us a little bit, each of you, how did you get into farming? Uh, well, me personally, I was always interested in kind of environmental conservation work. So after college, uh, I kind of did a little bit of that and then was always interested in, uh, in farming and reading about agriculture and some of the problems with it and eventually interned at a farm and then really fell in love with it and then just kept working it. So how long ago farms. was that? Um, it's, I guess that was about 2012, so it's been about eight years of interning and then getting like a full-time job at a farm and then eventually moving here, starting our own thing. Here. All right. Yeah. And Rachel? Um, I think my interest in farming initially began because I was a weaver and I was really interested in getting back to the source of everything I was using. So I got really interested in sheep and wool and um, cotton as well. And then out of that spun more of an interest in getting to like the source of food and understanding where food comes from. Um, and then starting to date Dylan and moving down to the farm he was working on. And um, at the time I was working at a school, so I had my summers off. And so I spent a lot of summers farming and also helping friends who are flower farmers. Um, and so then when Dylan felt ready to move here and start his own thing, I thought, all right, I'll hop right in. <laughs> okay. And how long have you been here in Johnson City? Uh, this is our third kind of growing season. So we're in the middle of our third season here. Um, so yeah, about two, two and a half, three years. And we're <laughs> in urban Johnson City. That's so, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how big was the lot when you bought the house and the lot? How big is the lot that you're farming? Yeah, the lot with the house is just under a half acre, um, but it's it's pretty much residential. It's a, it's a neighborhood outside downtown Johnson City. So, but it was kind of an unusual lot. So it was kind of big, kind of pretty flat, has fencing all around it. So the house. Um, was just a way to kind of start really small and you know not a, we were able to save a little money but didn't have a huge amount of capital to buy some big huge acreage farm so mm -hmm. it was a way for us to start small and and go from there so okay. <laughs> so talk about your your method what are the methods that you use on the farm and and why do you use those methods yeah, at the beginning we were kind of experimenting, but it's mostly a no-till uh, system, which I know is kind of, can be kind of vague sounding, but um, the way we do it is we pretty much have permanent beds that we stake out and then do, um, put a lot of compost down in those beds. And then um, instead of uh, renting or buying a tiller, we just, um, kind of loosen the soil initially with like a broad fork or a digging fork to kind of aerate it a little bit. And then the compost is a thick layer that kind of acts like a mulch, but also creates a good seed bed for transplanting and direct seeding. And then um, since we're so small that we'll rotate, as soon as the crop's done, we'll kind of rotate out and um, plant something right into it as soon as it's done. And then in the winter we use kind of uh, either tarps or this year we're going to do a little more cover cropping and just a, or a, just leaf mulch to mm -hmm. overwinter our beds and then in the spring we'll remove that and then add more compost. So that's kind of the idea of the no-till is you're adding a lot of organic matter and you're not tilling it in, you're just kind of um, building kind of a top layer and then over time it, it works into the soil by growing crops and, and cover cropping and things like that. Okay. So Rachel, if somebody was just starting out, I mean, they've got grass, mm -hmm. how would you start this system? Yeah. So what we did is we bought the house in July or August and Dylan drove out and we had bought silage tarps and uh, we tarped this entire area. Um, so this whole block, we put tarps down with sand and weighted it with sandbags and kept that on until we were ready to start built like making our beds in March. So 
um, with that about six months or so of keeping the tarp on, um, all of our grass and other lawn weeds died. Mm -hmm. And we were able to then form our beds on top of pretty much bare soil. Yeah. Tarps work in a way because it just smothers the, the grass and things like so. We even had Bermuda grass and um, doing it in the heat is pretty ideal. It just takes time compared to, you know, if you're tilling, you can till it kind of any time mm -hmm. of the spring or summer, but tarps just take longer, but it's it's a way to get kind of a, a clean, stale seed bed kind of thing to, to then start making your beds. Um, but that's what we did. We experimented a little bit with just putting other kind of mulches and things like that, but um, and I don't think it's a bad thing to till initially if that's uh, something, but I think the problem with tilling over and over again is it messes up the, the soil structure and then weed pressure and things like that. So that's why no-till is kind of an ideal system for us on a small scale because it over time eliminates those, those problems and you don't need to invest in a big, big piece of equipment. So at the end of the season, mm -hmm. what do you do with the plants? I mean, do you pull them up? What do you do? So at the end of any crop, we go through and cut it right at the base. If it's a crop that still has something above ground, we'll cut it right at the base. And then um, depending on what it is and how readily it'll shoot back up, maybe from that stalk that's cut right at the ground, we'll either flame it or we'll tarp it for like a week or two um, and then put the next crop in. Yeah, that's more what we do kind of in the middle of the season. Like if we have a spring, pro screen, spring crop that's coming out and then we'll plant a summer crop. If it's um, salad greens or something, we might just uh, cut it really low and then um, either just uh, flame it with a flame weeder or we'll put just uh, landscape fabric over that one bed or that one section for maybe a week and that will pretty much kill it from regrowing and then you can just um, plant your next crop in behind that and it doesn't really regrow. Um, hmm. So that's kind of the more what we've been doing in the spring and when it's done done in the fall we usually try to follow it with a cover crop or an overwintered crop something that's either going to be growing in it or if it's just too late, we'll um, cover it with a tarp or um, this year, I think we're gonna do some leaf, just leaf mulch mm -hmm. over the bed. And then um, that way you're not losing your soil to erosion over the winter. So it kind of retains the soil okay. that way. Since we do put a lot of uh, labor into spreading compost, we don't want it eroding or <laughs> disappearing. So yeah. any way we can cover it over winter is is pretty important so um, but yeah that's typically how we flip beds and again we flip them pretty quick in the summer um, and spring or if it's just a long season crop summer crop we'll just usually keep that going until uh, fall when we will cover crop it behind okay. yeah so let's talk about what you grow so what do you grow here uh, well, we have a CSA program, so we're kind of, we have to grow a good variety for that. Um, but we do kind of all the, the classic um, stuff. So in the summer right now, we have peppers and eggplants, squash. Green beans, okra, a lot of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And we still try to keep going with uh, like uh, some greens, like arugula and lettuce we can usually have in some form through the through the summer Swiss chard mm -hmm. and then in the spring and fall it's a lot more of the brassicas so um, turnips and cabbage uh, broccoli mm -hmm. um, things like that um, there's certain things that we just kind of grow for the CSA that we're not selling a, uh, a lot extra just because they take up a lot of time and space so the things we sell um, on top of our CSA are usually the, the more popular items, so like salad greens and carrots and beets and things like that, whereas we don't grow, kind of just grow enough of the cabbage and 
broccoli for CSA members so they have a good mix of variety in mm -hmm. their shares through the season. Um, and then in the winter, we um, are going to try to grow a lot more, just cut greens and a few roots, root crops in these tunnels, which are new to us this year. So this will be the first winter mm -hmm. of kind of overwintering a lot more. So. And then we also do a small flower CSA share, and so we have flowers spread out all around as well. Okay. How many people are in your CSAs together? Or? We have about 36, 35 members. Mm -hmm. so on the vegetable side. On the vegetable, and then we have... About five flower CSA members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have two sizes of the vegetable uh, CSA, so um, it just depends on the person. Some families get the larger one, and then the, the smaller one's kind of more geared towards individuals or couples that don't um, mm -hmm. cook a ton but still want some fresh vegetables each week so and when does your CSA start and end we started it starts about mid-may I think we started May 17th or something this year and then we do 25 weeks so that should take us to the end of October early October or November mm -hmm. um, and then we might do a little extension. Um, we kind of did that last year where we did a month extension through November uh, as an extra bonus for some people because for people that sign up that really like it, it's 25 weeks and then all of a sudden it's over and it's kind of, I think, shocking for them. So they <laughs> want to keep it going in some form. So, um, but it just depends on the, on the weather and how things are growing at that time of year. So. Okay. Yeah. And then last year you expanded out to Grand Oak Farm. That's right. And, yep. and what was your reason for doing that? Yeah, going out to Grand Oak was a way for us to grow a lot more variety and mainly storage crops that we just don't have the space um, or the time to grow here. So things like potatoes and bulbed onions. Um, winter squash. Winter squash. Um, those things just take a lot of a lot of time and space so it was a good way for us to to have that to sell as a kind of extra thing for our CSA as well. So what talk about your markets and then what we'll do is we'll take a tour and we want you to show you what you do and how you do it but okay. what what are your markets and they could have changed dramatically this year from right. last year but yeah. um, so what markets have you used, you know, and especially this year, what are you doing? Um, so we've sold to uh, through the Johnson City and Jonesboro Farmers Market in past years. Mm -hmm. um, this year we decided just to do the Jonesboro Farmers Market because they transitioned all online. And so that frees up our Saturday. So we're not spending four hours um, at a market and we also pre-sell everything through the online market so we're not ever having to deal with over harvesting or having extra after a farmer's market um, and that's been great for us this year um, the online market has really expanded our sales that we'd had in at Jonesboro in the past so that's been great um, like I said we've always we've done a CSA and this year as well with COVID it seemed like there was a lot more interest in CSAs and so um, we were able to fill up our CSA pretty early on. Um, I think by March we were probably sold out. Yeah. Um, March or early April. Um, and then we sell to restaurants, which at the beginning of our season, most of them were still closed. Um, but they've all the m restaurants we sell to have opened back up. And so they're all ordering. Um, pretty comparable to what they'd ordered in years past. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit less, but um, I think we're also growing more, so we're able to sell mm -hmm. maybe more than we could last year. So mm -hmm. it's kind and, of balanced out. <coughs> and then do you do special events for people, for flowers? Um, yeah, we do weddings occasionally. Um, I'm not maybe the best at advertising that, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, if people know me or us, then then they'll know to ask for something like that. So we've done 
some weddings. We did more weddings last year than this year. I think probably not a lot of weddings. <laughs> not a lot of weddings, or they're happening in a different way this year. Yeah. Um, but that's that's been all right. We've been selling more flowers um, through the online market, surprisingly, mm -hmm. um, than we have uh, necessarily in the past at the Jonesboro Farmers Market. Okay. So that's Good. been a surprising positive. Okay. Yeah. So we're standing in, sun, in front of some um, caterpillar tunnels. So why don't you talk a little <coughs> bit about um, why you got these and, you know, installation of them and um, how do you like them? Um, yeah, we got these in January through uh, a tape grant, which is a grant through the state. Um, it was a cost share, so they have different percentages, but we got 50% cost share on these. And um, the reason we got them was uh, for multiple reasons. The main one was for the winter to have kind of a more controlled, heated environment through, through the winter. But it's also great for the summer because we can grow summer crops and um, like tomatoes and these are peppers and then eggplant and by keeping them undercover they get less uh, diseases and things like that so our pepper and tomato crops and uh, even the eggplant has done a lot better than last year just by keeping them in the tunnel uh, the trade-off is you have to have some kind of irrigation set up but we just use drip tape which is a pretty cost-effective way of irrigating um, so yeah it, it just allows you to have kind of fit more into a smaller space and get a bigger kind of yield and um, and just healthier plants so you don't have to do as many successions or any successions um, so we found that to be really helpful this summer we haven't quite done the full winter thing we'll find out i guess later this winter mm -hmm. how that goes but um we'll close off the the ends for that and keep it nice and tight and um even put you know row cover inside if it gets really cold so mm -hmm. we're looking forward to that because it'll allow us to kind of have more income throughout the year and kind of space out our income hopefully and uh I think there's uh, a good market for selling vegetables in the winter. It's mm -hmm. pretty hard to have continuous crops in that in that sense. So, yeah, I think overall it's it'll be a good investment for us. And um, the structure itself came in a kit, so it's very easy to put together and and um, pretty pretty cost effective. Who did you order your kit from? We bought it through Farmer's Friend, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, in central Tennessee, mm -hmm. but they have a pretty big following. But yeah, very nice to work with, very straightforward and assembling and um, pretty much just did it. Yeah, we, I mean, the whole thing was just the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, it's a pretty easy thing to build. And you haven't had to use shade cloths? this summer no we haven't um i there we, you know we're still learning as we go we definitely have a little bit of sun scalding on certain certain crops um so that's definitely something to maybe consider i think also we're still constantly trying to fix our soil and uh, amending it and getting it remineralized and i think um a lot of it, it's just the plants aren't as happy just because of the soil. Um, so I think having a healthier plant would give it a little more shade as well. But um, but a, sh a shade cloth could be uh, an option if it is a problem we continue to have for mm -hmm. the summer crops. And you grow organically. You're not certified organic, but you grow organically. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that um, how do you handle pests? then you know um yeah we don't use any kind of uh amendment or sprays or anything like that we really just use uh row covers for certain crops um mainly the brassicas so uh arugula and mm -hmm. kale and 
things like that that get a lot of uh, flea beetles and harlequin bugs and things like that. So we just use that cloth material. Um, we use it a lot more in the spring and fall. And that's really the only other kind of pest management besides just kind of trying to keep the beds clean and, and having really healthy plants and amending the mm -hmm. soil and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, every year is kind of different too. It just depends. Um, I feel like this year's been pretty manageable with pests, not, not too bad. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'd say another thing we're trying um, is intercropping with uh, flowers that mm. are supposed to, supposed to bring and attract beneficial insects and maybe even insects that will um, keep pests uh, more at bay. So that's something we're trying. Like you can see um, some gem marigolds there and earlier, although they've kind of all flowered and died back, we'd put sweet alyssum in between a lot of our pepper crops and tomato crops. Um, so we're also doing more of that, but also focusing on soil health is like building healthier, more robust plants so that if, if and when pests come, they're more able to fight it off themselves. What do you do for nutrients? Uh, we, we add, um, some natural, organic natural amendments. So the main thing we use is, uh, organic, it's a chicken manure kind of based uh, amendment from Seven Springs Farm. And then we'll add a lot of uh, like rock minerals for just to add soil, to help with the soil structure and um, adding micronutrients. So we'll add, we always add a little bit of lime just because um, our calcium is always a little low. So always adding that and uh, gypsum, which is something we're going to start adding, which also has calcium, but also sulfur. And then we'll add uh, azomite. We'll do a little bit of kale or kelp and um, some things like that. That is more of just kind of helping with the long-term effects of the soil because mm -hmm. we do have a lot of compaction and a little clay heavy areas. So uh, we're hoping that over time will kind of loosen it instead of just dumping it all at once. We're kind of adding it before each crop and letting it work in um, year after year. So we're kind of adding for, we're adding stuff for the long term, but also the mm -hmm. short term, which is more of the, the chicken fertilizer, which has more of the nitrogen um, that is for the mm -hmm. for the crops that for annual crops. Yeah. So what do you think the effect on your system by being covered, the soil being covered? Do you think it'll make changes? This is your first year, so you don't really know. True. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Um, I I think the long term, I think, um, yeah, it'll just be a different way to manage it, make sure it has enough water, um, giving things breaks and not, um, we don't do overdo the, the fertilizer as much this year in the, in the tunnel. So um, that's definitely something we're aware of, but I think as the seasons go on, I think it'll probably just be really important to get a soil test Mm -hmm. um, specifically in each tunnel potentially mm -hmm. and just making sure your levels of nutrients are, are right and you're not um, overloading anything mm -hmm. um, which a soil test is always good to get in general even if it's not covered just to give you an idea of what's mm -hmm. what's going on so I think that's probably how we'll approach it but yeah you're right it's it's new so we'll have to definitely be aware of all that because the biggest things are salts usually that built up because mm -hmm. you don't have the rainfall leaching that down through the, the soil structure, you know. Right. But these are supposed to, the plastic is supposed to last how many years? Uh, I think they should last, you know, five to maybe eight years or something. I think it just depends on mm -hmm. how, how beat up they get from yeah. the weather and the wind. But um, yeah, I'm hopeful at least five years. So, mm -hmm. and again, that's something that's, it's pretty easy to, to, to fix and it's, uh, for what you get out of it, it's uh, pretty cost effective to sure. replace. So. so why don't we take a tour? 
You want to start out here with the flowers and work <laughs> sure. our way across? Okay. And <laughs> so this year, well, we just don't love mowing. That's not why we got into farming. So part of the idea was that we wanted less to mow. And then also in March when we were thinking about COVID and what that meant for our business, we felt like with our CSA filling up so quickly, maybe it would make more sense to give more space for vegetable crops on our established beds. And so we had been tarping this area, although not as long as would have been ideal. Um, but anyway, so we threw out all of our kind of first succession flowers out here instead of in our established beds and then are hopefully going to move to perennialize like only perennials out here so that we don't have to maintain it and it can kind of just grow up year to year and then there's some things um, like the tithonia the mexican sunflower that i don't use as a cut flower but is just to attract butterflies and um, other insects and so yeah, just to have something nice to look at, use some of the cut flowers, um, and we don't have to mow it. Yeah. <laughs> so let's step back here so she can get a shot because it's beautiful all the way down. So what would you use as a perennial flower? Um, well, I've already got some like echinacea in here, and um, this variety of rutabecchia is a perennial. Um, and so growing more of that, we might... Uh, talk to Christy Chevelle about getting some native pollinators in here or just kind of capturing our own seed. I planted a lot of flowering tobacco which I have a feeling is just going to reseed itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it has it produces a ton of seed okay. and there's some sweet annie at the end too that is probably going to reseed itself. So also thinking about not just perennials but if something will readily reseed then mm -hmm. we're open to that too. Um, so yeah, this is an area we kind of uh, didn't start until last year, so we still fighting a little, this is probably the area we're fighting the grass the most, um, but we're getting a pretty good handle on it, and this year we grew um, kind of a, a, a later planting of green beans, which are about done. We're probably going to pick them and clear them this week. And then you can see we've already come in behind it and started seeding uh, arugula and radishes and turnips, which are mainly under these uh, row covers, which are used for the bug protection. So we'll probably, usually when you plant them so closely, um, you can kind of see the arugula just coming up here mm -hmm. with a direct seeder. We seed six rows um, pretty thickly. And then... Um, We'll use that as a cut green and so we'll probably just cultivate it once and then that's about it so that's kind of the nice thing about the the no-till is our beds are are pretty weed free especially doing it after year after year and adding more compost each year um, the problem we're finding now is we're fighting the pathways more than we are the beds so we're going to start uh, wood chipping which we started a little bit but that's kind of the winter fall project is to get a lot of these beds and wood chips and then hopefully that'll cut back even more hoeing and weeding which is mainly coming from the pathways at this point so mm -hmm. um, and then yeah this is just another late planting of tomatoes that we're just gonna try to take till till September but we're starting to get into our fall fall mindset of getting fall things ready and established so we're kind of feeling the, the summer slump where we're almost at the finish line of, of seeding on top of harvesting every day. So. Right. Yeah, so I've been growing our dahlias. So that means every year I cut them at the base after the first frost um, and let them get about maybe two or three frosts on them. And then I dig them all up and store them for the winter. And then I am not very good at seeing the eyes on them. So I prefer to store them in peat moss through the winter in our kind of like crawl space under the house. And then in the <coughs> spring, I pull them out and you can see more clearly on the eyes. So you can see where to divide them easier for me. Um, and then 
I, I plant them back out. So I've been building up our collection of dahlia tubers and I thought I'd keep them in the ground over winter this year, but I have a lot of one type of dahlia as you can see and so I'm probably gonna thin out some of those, cull out some of those and then um, dig out the dahlias that I like a lot and divide those and plant more of them next year. And then I finally wised up and listened to Linda Doan up at Aunt Willie's Wildflowers up in Bluntville, even though I only listened halfway. <laughs> Linda, if you watch it, I'm sorry. But so I mulched it heavy, and so the soil's retaining a lot more moisture this year, so they're a lot happier than the ones that I grew last year. And I did the Hortonova netting um, horizontally across the dahlias, but then I didn't do the second line. So I am starting to have some in the back, especially start toppling a little bit. So next year I'll be more on it. I'll get my second row of netting on, Constant, constantly learning. <laughs> yeah. And so then you've got row covers here. What's, uh -huh. what's underneath the row cover that you have? Um, that's uh, cauliflower that we're growing for the, for the fall. So we, uh, started that from seed in our greenhouse and then transplanted that out uh, about a month ago. So a lot of those fall crops, um, you have to start kind of in the middle of the summer and really kind of baby them even though they don't like being out in the hot summer heat, but that's kind of when you have to start them. You have to start them early so they can head up in time before it gets too cold. Um, so yeah, we have cauliflower under there, and again, that's for the for the bugs and the pests. And then right next to that, we have uh, summer squash, which uh, we just plant multiple successions. So we've planted four successions this year. This is our third, because um, uh, once they start producing, they you can usually pick them for for about three weeks, four weeks at the most, and then the plants just start to die back or they just mature and they just don't put out as much fruit. So things like squash and beans, we plant multiple successions to have that um, available through through the summer. Okay, so let's just go take our way. Sure. <laughs> and so you said you had eggplant and peppers and... Yep, there's a row of eggplant and then a row and a half of, of peppers here we have pretty much just sweet peppers, but different types. Um, and then we have uh, two, two beds of, of uh, tomatoes, which are um, a determinate type, uh, which is new, which don't get as tall. So we planted those kind of late. So uh, with tomatoes, you'll see we, we plant a lot of successions of those too, especially ones that are outside just because um, they'll get diseases a little bit faster outside because we just do this Florida stake and weave. So we just, uh, as it grows, we just kind of hold it, hold it upright with string. Um, so that's kind of a weekly chore for the tomatoes when we, when we uh, grow them outside. But doing the successions allows you to kind of have different flushes of tomatoes so you don't kind of hit a wall where you don't have as much um, Especially again when we're on a small scale, kind of have to cover your bases and plan a little bit extra to make sure you mm -hmm. are having enough. Um, but before we planted all this stuff, we had a, we had a, an early spring crop, so we had arugula and turnips and radishes in here because we seeded all that um, as soon as we built these. And then by the time these were ready to transplant, we uh, and uh, April, all that crop was was ready to come out. So that was the nice thing about these these tunnels is you can kind of maximize uh, your crops because they grow a little bit quicker that way. Okay, and fennel then is that? Your yeah, this was fennel, and then I we just harvested it, and then this is actually just it regrowing, yeah. which is kind of. Interesting. interesting yeah, yeah. I've never <laughs> some of them it. are actually sizing up to pretty yeah good size heads but again we're kind of getting ready for fall stuff so we're kind of just um, 
clearing out beds a little bit and trying to give them a little time to get ready, but we just saw that this was regrowing, so we just let it let go it and go. we'll cut, okay. cut some fennel later. <clears throat> um, this is more fall crops, so we have a little bit of uh, Brussels sprouts and then it turns into collard greens and then this is all uh, broccoli. So again, all that stuff, you kind of have to start from seed in June and then you transplant it in July and then you just have to hope that you can keep it going. So having drip tape is pretty, pretty important, but luckily it's been pretty wet and, and mild this year. So um, things are doing pretty good, but we still have some bug problems. Um, but that was kind of a mistake on our end from growing them in the greenhouse. We, uh, the greenhouse is just too open and so bugs are able to come in. So mm -hmm. we've been fighting the bugs. Um, but that was just a mistake on our, uh, our end. You can also show them the mulched pathways and the mushrooms and oh, stuff yeah. growing in there. Oh, right, yeah. So this is, we mulched these pathways here. I don't know, you can kind of see yeah. some mushrooms coming in here. So that's kind of the added, other added benefit. Instead of fighting weeds, you're actually adding uh, some fungal activity, which um, is always important for, for plants and um, that's the only reason of doing no-tills. You're, you're trying to support the biology in the soil. Um, by not tilling it, you're, you're creating more um, communities of that. So adding the, adding the wood chips is hopefully just an, another factor that'll benefit. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is more summer stuff. We had uh, onions and lettuce in this far bed and now we're gonna get it ready for for fall planting we'll probably put um, try to put some overwintered Swiss chard or or kale or something like that in there and then these are uh, cucumbers and then tomatoes and then on this far side we have uh, some basil and um, some lettuce that is about to be finished but so yeah this is a different style of trellising uh, cucumbers and tomatoes it's uh you prune them really hard so you just have a single liter so you take all these kind of side shoots off the tomatoes and then just you clip them to the line and then once they get to the top we have these roller uh, clips that you um, can lower and then as it gets as you lower it you just kind of move the plants down um, so that was something new this year. Um, again, our soil is kind of weird, so it's a little better in the back. So we're actually leaning a lot more stuff in the back, whereas up front here, it's a lot more compact. So uh, that's the <laughs> can be the problem of of uh, starting in a in a more urban area. There, you definitely have areas that are pretty pretty compact. Um, but that being said, we've gotten away with. Uh, <laughs> growing things, especially carrots and things like that, that you wouldn't think would, would grow in some soil, but we've been able to do it. But again, that's the, that's the goal every year is you're, you're seeing a little bit of added benefit um, from doing the no-till and adding the, the nutrients each year. But um, yeah, the trellis system works pretty well. It's more labor intensive because you, it's kind of a weekly chore where you have to come out, prune it, clip it. Um, so I don't know if it's something uh, I'm going to do uh, all the time or like switch to completely, but it's a nice balance with the outside tomatoes um, to have to have these because they're a little more consistent, whereas the outdoor ones kind of put on a bigger flush and then they might slow down and then they kind of put on a, another flush. Whereas these, you can kind of get a steady supply each each week, so it's a nice balance with uh, with the uh, other tomatoes. So, did you grow indeterminate tomatoes before, or because yeah, these are yeah. Usually, the ones outside we do inter indeterminate, and um, so what did you do with them when before you did this? system yeah I mean we can show you they just we use a t-post system with the with the Florida, Florida weave 
and then once they just get tall they just kind of fall over okay. so it's just kind of <laughs> okay <laughs> the nature of the thing of the thing so uh, that's why we do a little more successions because um, they won't last as long whereas like yeah these we planted in April and we'll probably keep them till um, you know end of September and it's just going to be one plant and you can tell they're a lot healthier they don't get diseases um, mm -hmm. they don't get blight um, so because they're not getting rained on and mm -hmm. the humidity's um, not getting to them so um, that's why it's kind of nice to have a little bit of both okay yeah. let's keep moving <clears throat> and tell us what else what else um, this is our last planting of uh, green beans here. You can see they haven't flowered yet, but they're starting to bud up. And then on the back half is just the end of our carrots. So we grow a lot of carrots and by this point the tops aren't great. So we're just topping them and washing them um, as topped carrots and selling them in bags or as bulk carrots. Um, and under here is, is more of the, the fall stuff. So this is a whole bed of cabbage and then another bed of, of broccoli here. So two beds. And um, hopefully all that stuff will be ready by the end of September when, when uh, summer stuff's slowing down. Um, and then this is a little short tunnel here that we have... Uh, we had a uh, salad greens in here and um, Rachel had some some flowers here and now we're doing uh, more cabbage and uh, our last planting of summer squash and under that cover is, is more uh, arugula and some lettuce and things like that. Okay, let's look at your greenhouse. So you don't buy plants, you start all your own plants? Yeah, we, we start all, all all plants but um, we do a lot of direct seeding it just depends on the crop but this is uh, what we learned where the bugs you know when you keep it open bugs can still get in so we use a row cover now because we don't want it to get too hot in there but it's still uh, still protected so but yeah right now we don't have a ton of stuff since we've been planting all our uh, fall things but we do have some onions and lettuce in there but you basically plant everything you grew here in this little greenhouse yeah and the spring the spring is when this thing is just loaded down and everything's on the floor and because we start our tomatoes and peppers and you know we pot them up to be pretty big mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, you can't even walk in there and flower, starting all yeah. our flowers. There's like a very narrow footpath <laughs> in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, behind you here. Yeah, so this, uh, these are uh, like a fall planting of carrots. So before this we had, uh, it was half summer squash and half green beans, which was the first seeding of that. And then we cleared that out in July. And then as soon as that was cleared, we we flipped the beds and direct seeded uh, carrots and there's kind of beets on the, the last bed but um, so these carrots should be ready by October um, and we use a direct seeder for this we use a Jang seeder mm -hmm. which is probably one of the most expensive things that we bought at the beginning but for direct seeding it's it's great because it has um, the precision on it is is really good and you can literally just like run with it back and forth so it's it's very quick and then as long as your conditions are right you can uh, get really good germination and nice pretty straight lines <laughs> yeah <laughs> still <laughs> still get a little lazy with the okay. straight and narrow but um and yeah this is an example of our uh when we tarp something so this was full of spring uh, cabbage and broccoli and kale and collards which we start in um, early March and then as transplants and then um, they lasted till in the end of June so we're just gonna we've just been tarping it and then we're gonna probably in the next week or two uncover it and then I'm gonna 
put in a cover crop of cow peas and spring oats, which will be uh, a cover crop that'll pretty much winter kill. So it'll hopefully have enough time to grow a good size. And then once it gets cold in November, um, the, the plants will die so they won't mature or set fruit or anything. And then um, that'll create a good ground cover and also add some nutrients and organic matter um, because we're going to plant another early spring crop next uh, next year behind it. So we want to make sure it's not some big cover crop like ryegrass or, or some kind of overwintering clover or vetch because we want to make sure we can plant stuff into it uh, by March. So okay. that's an example of, of doing a cover crop. Well, let's move to our last section here. Yeah, this is the last little paddock here and this is mainly summer stuff. So we have a lot of tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, slicer t tomatoes, and then these uh, big tall plants are okra. So we have three beds of that. We have a few random flower beds. There's um, Swiss chard and some eggplant kind of on the side, but um, you can see that the tomatoes, they get the blight when it, uh, when it gets wet and really, it's been a really wet year, but so this is just uh, kind of the nature of things. So that's why we do multiple plantings because they're just not going to last as long, but that's um, one of the benefits of adding a tunnel, so you can avoid that. So are um, you going to get more tunnel? Uh, not this winter. I think we'll see how the winter goes. Okay. Um, but yeah, depending on how it goes, it's definitely something we, we might consider. I think uh, our greenhouse is getting so tight that we might convert that short one into more of a greenhouse, uh -huh. maybe move it over, over here. here. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. because uh, I think doing transplants just saves you a lot of time and, and when you're tight on space, um, you can, you can squeeze more in throughout the season if you can transplant a little bit more. So, um, so in ending up, um, you don't have a cooler right now, right? Right. Yeah. But we you're don't, working toward one maybe. We're working towards, yeah, bigger walk-in cooler, uh, Pretty much everything now is, is either uh, we pick it the morning of that we sell it. So for restaurants and CSA, we, we pick it that morning and then give it to the, to the members and the clients that, that day. So as long as you kind of keep it out of the, the, the heat and stuff, we found that you can uh, get by. But it's definitely ideal and gives you more flexibility to have a cooler when you can kind of pick something um, when it's ready is sometimes a challenge like radishes or things like that if it's ready That day it would be nice to pick it. So sometimes if you wait um, It can throw off a crop. So mm -hmm. we also have um, This year too. We were really fortunate that a friend of ours offered use of their walk-in cooler right. um, It's not super close, but that gave us the flexibility of harvesting for Saturday farmer's market on Friday and then driving it to their cooler mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then picking it up Saturday morning and taking it to the market. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, that'll be a winter project, fall winter project to get done. Mm -hmm. Okay. So ending up here, we really appreciate you coming out and talking about this. If someone, I mean, what's advice for somebody that would want to start this no-till system? I mean, they definitely are going to need to have tarps and mulch and... Yeah, I, yeah, I think access to, to compost or having the ability to make a large amount yourself is, is pretty key. Um, over time, you know, the goal is you use less and less. I think it just depends on what you're starting off with. But again, I'm not opposed to, to tilling like initially, um, I don't know if every no-till person would say that, but um, but I, I would potentially start either with like tilling and then putting in a cover crop and then tarping it that way, or um, just tarping and and then adding, you know, your organic compost on top of that. Um, 
but I think the main thing is just to start small. Um, we didn't start all this the first year. We kind of started in little paddocks, and this is the first year that we've been growing off every little kind of square inch that we have that's you know usable. Um, so I definitely say start small because it allows you to kind of um, find your community, find your markets. Um, so I think that has been uh, something I've learned working at other farms is if you go big really quickly, you uh, can get burned out or overwhelmed pretty pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Right, Joe? Yeah, and I think too, I think investing in a smart way. So we didn't go out and buy every tool we thought we would want or need right up front because we didn't have, you know, an unending bank account. And so we definitely would do things maybe with not the right tool and then discover, okay, this is a tool we would need consistently and is worth the investment versus like, this is something we might need once and should probably try and borrow from somebody or, you know, make do without because we don't need it in the long run. So I think that's been really helpful. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we are really lucky because we're about five minutes away from Joe Hoffman, who we get all of our compost from. And so we've been able to have a really close working relationship and a really flexible relationship because he is so close. It's, it's been really easy to call him and get it pretty mm -hmm. instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So that's been really great too. Okay. But yeah, I think Dylan, Dylan covered it. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, as soon as we finish this, we'll have people asking questions. But thank you again for having us come today. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks for, for coming out. Yeah, thank you. Okay.